Hey everybody, it's Sam with Wrestling Overtime, and we are doing Rants and Raves review for AEW Dynamite in Salt Lake City on March the 11th, 2020. And, uh, I wasn't sure what to expect with this show. Um, I hadn't really thought a whole lot about it. I'm, I'll just be honest with you. I knew that um, Kitty was out. I had read that in the, the news and everything. So, I really wasn't 100% sure what was going to happen. And so, when they started out uh, interviewing Hangman Page about Kenny Omega being out, I was thinking, well, gee, wonder what is exactly going to happen with his battle with Chris Jericho and Sammy Guevara? Um, supposedly, Kenny Omega has a broken hand, and they're saying he's going to be out weeks. Well, Blood and Guts is supposed to be March 25th, and that's two weeks. I can't see him you know, performing in that, unless they're going to let him have some kind of soft cast on and use that, because the rules say that you have to submit or surrender, so therefore, you know, him having a soft cast on maybe wouldn't have anything to do with submission or surrendering, I don't know, um, just kind of thinking ahead, I guess, wondering how that's gonna, how that's gonna actually play out. So they interview, uh, Heyman Page about who is his tag team partner tonight. And the Young Bucks say, is this the reason why you brought us out here? And Hangman is pretty much like, um, no. And he trashes them. And says that his partner's going to be a mystery, and then walks away. I don't know about you, um, I've always gotten the feeling that Hangman doesn't really fit in with the Elite. I, I don't watch, uh, being the Elite. I keep saying I'm going to pick it up, and I haven't yet. But I just don't see him really fitting in with them that well. It, it's kind of shocked me that... They, they meaning AEW, since they've been on air, has really made Hangman Page seem like he's part of the elite, when I'm not sure that he is. Maybe they're trying to recreate the Bullet Club, and he's the young member that's going to carry on the tradition of the elite, or something like that. Um, I can't help but think... Uh, he, in his character, that Hangman Page at that minute had saw what Darby Allen did last week after they hurt John Moxley, and I'm sure he feels like he beat Jericho and Sammy alone. Of course, you know, it's always a numbers game with the inner circle. All five of them always come out, and you really got to end up beating all five of them. We all know Hangman Page can't do that. Um, so, actually, the the show starts off with Santana and Ortiz coming out. And they talk about how Ortiz hit Cody with a chair last week. So, Cody really wants to get him in the ring this week, and that he comes out with Brandy and Iron Anderson. And my first thought, you know, when I'm seeing them walk down the ramp is, boy, uh, Brandy can switch up. She can play the sweet wife of Cody Rhodes, but, you know, before... The, the year, or right around the beginning of the year, um, right around Christmas and a little after New Year's and stuff, we were still seeing her of the um, evil master of the Nightmare Collective, you know. And so, 
I thought she did good in both characters in both roles, and she really has that in her. And, you know, watch her tonight be the sweet wife of Cody and kiss him and and being dressed completely different you see how versatile Brandy Rhodes can be and how valuable she could be to this company if they would use her correctly I I just hope that she's working a lot more on her wrestling um I'm sorry, I just think Ortiz looks like a crazy madman with that hairdo that he keeps coming out. Um, he is what I picture a bigger, taller, stronger Rasputin look by looked like, you know, back in the czar age, uh, with that wild-eyed look that he's got, um, and Santana comes out, and he's not wearing his eye patch anymore, he was wearing sunglasses, but when he took them off, I mean, he doesn't have the, the bruising and, and everything that Moxley has around his eye and, and everything, so I'm gonna make the assumption that, his eyes all better and everything. As the match gets started, um, Jake the Snake Roberts walks in with Lance Archer as his client. I know a lot of you out there were expecting Brody Lee. And um, it, I think, caught a lot of the wrestling internet community kind of off guard and then some people who don't really follow indies or haven't followed lance archer i think it probably caught them completely off guard because they were like "Mm, who is this you know and i'm gonna be real honest with you i haven't followed lance archer's career in detail So, I am really looking to see how he develops and what kind of character he plays in AEW. I want to see what he has to bring. And I want to see how Jake Roberts works with him. Um, To me, it makes sense to have, you know, Jake the Snake Roberts speak for him. But I look slowly, I hope, that Lance Archer will will start speaking too. I hope he doesn't become Brock Lesnar where he doesn't speak at all. I, I hope that he really gets involved. And I also hope that Jake the Snake Roberts gets involved in matches. Way more than Iron Anderson does. Um, Iron Anderson may distract the referee or... Um, shove somebody or something like that i i would kind of like to see jake roberts get a little more involved um not always physical but even playing mind games and 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 talking and everything so i'm interested in seeing that um i really like this match cody was selling his legs um i love that brandy hauled off and slapped him and then Cody diving through the ropes at Santana going after Arn. I liked how, you know, Cody stood up for him and everything. I almost wish, though, that Arn would have gotten involved and almost proved he didn't really need Cody to stand up with it for him anymore. You know, um, I know Arn is old. Or older, I should say. But, I do want him, every once in a while, to show that glimmer of of who he is and who he was and everything. Uh, while this was going on, I liked that uh, Lance Archer stood up. I like he was going to jump the rail and Jack Roberts, you know, kind of had to talk him out of it, talk him down and everything. And... I really enjoyed that Cody won with the figure four. I'm glad that he is bringing that back. 
I think that is a move that for so long people were almost afraid to use because it was so synonymous with Ric Flair. Even though the figure four, you know, of course is one of the, I think, most powerful, well-known moves that as kids we tried. Um, you know, I had a cousin that always wanted to do the figure four leg lock on all of us, you know, in the neighborhood and everything. Um, so I think the figure four leg lock is something that kids of my generation and a little bit younger than me grew up with. And it's good to see it come back. I, I don't want Charlotte Flair to be the only one that uses that. And I know that she uses the figure eight a lot with the bridge and everything. But I'm glad to see Cody winning with that. Uh, then, of course, we have Santana hitting him from behind. And Iron Anderson and Matt Jackson and Kenny Omega jump in the ring kind of to, to save Cody from the beatdown. Well, then we see... Chris Jericho and uh, Jake Hager and Sammy Grovar and his sunglasses appear on the screen. And of course, Chris Jericho is, is talking to them. You know, we've got blood and guts, you know, the inner circle versus the elite. The elite is basically in the ring other than, you know, um, Nick and, and Hangman Page. And Chris Jericho is, is kind of talking to him. And then he says, uh, you guys might be wondering where Nick is. Well, he has a little bit of a headache. And the camera kind of pans down and we see Nick caught under um, a door opening in the arena. They have obviously slammed that door down on him. He's stuck, and you can see him bleeding. Um, Jericho says that, you know, he probably needs a doctor. Um, so the elite run out of the ring, of course, and by the time they arrive, the inner circle is gone. Um, I love that AEW... When things like this happen, they don't continue it after the commercial. Uh, I think that's one of my big gripes is that should be done. And we actually see in real time what's going on because they show us the picture in picture of the medics arriving. Uh, I was I was really pleased that they either got real medics or they got actors that acted like real medics because they stabilized his neck uh they took him then removed the door and moved him out a little bit to place him on a bike board and then place him on a gurney um to get him out to the ambulance and then I also liked the realism that AEW showed us of Matt kind of being somewhat confused uh, about where to go, what to do. Should I be in the ambulance? Should should I do this? And you kind of see Cody take charge, even though he's still in his ring gear, and they get in a car to follow uh, the ambulance to the hospital and, you know, go with Nick there. And so I like that. A lot of times in WWE, we see them get in the ambulance with them. And number one, there's not a whole lot of room back there. And number two, I always wonder, you know, most people, the ambulance doesn't bring them back. So I always wonder when they show up at the end of the stage, did you call an Uber? You know, what exactly happened? So I liked how AEW actually shows a little realism of them actually jumping in a car. Now, 
Then we have the Chris Statlander Shadia match versus B Priestley and Nala Rose. I'm gonna be real honest with you. Um, Chris Chris Statlander's growing on me a little bit. Um, she does appear to have a lot of athleticism and talent, and I do want to see her grow. Not really buying the alien gimmick. But I'm giving her props for bringing it back. I I like gimmicks. Um, I know AEW is supposed to be, you know, more sports realism, more of a competition and, and all of that. But I like how they're letting some people have gimmicks and letting them be their own characters. So Chris Tyler is growing on me a little bit. And I have to say that I'm really starting to enjoy B. Priestley's work. Um, I have enjoyed her, I think, every time she has been on AEW or AEW Dark. And I have caught a couple of her indie matches, especially since some uh, links have, or I should say websites, are putting up links where you can go and watch matches for free. Some of them have been be Priestley, and I am really liking her work. I wish they would push her a little more. I don't know if the reason why she hasn't been on AEW a lot is because of her indie schedule. I'm sure she had a lot of things booked before she was signed to AEW and is actually getting those things, you know, kind of out of the way and seeing as many fans before she commits full-time to AEW, but I hope that once she can commit full-time, I hope they get B. Priestley in there and they actually really give her a push. Um, Nyla Rose, still don't know how I feel about her, uh, loved that she was showing her power, but when I think about it, she was showing a lot of her power against Shadia. Um, she did some against Statlander, but, I mean, it was mostly against Shadia, and the Japanese Josie wrestlers, they weigh under 100 pounds. I mean, Nyla Rose should be able to throw them all over the place and show her power and, and everything. Um, I loved the spear that she hit Shadia with and then hit the beast bomb on her for the win. Um... Nala acted a little confused, acted like she wanted to celebrate, but wasn't really sure. I love that B. Priestley climbed in the ring and attacked her, and basically just beat her down. Um, I hope this is the start of a program with them. Like I was saying, I I am a little bit intrigued by B. Priestley, her character that she plays on the indies, uh, the character she's played so far with AEW. I think her and Nala Rose could actually put on some really interesting matches, and B. Priestley on the mic, I think, can really drum up support and maybe start turning the women's division around just a little bit because I know all of us have have really been griping about the women's division and how Kenny Omega has to turn it around now I have to say um between this match and our next match we get Christopher Daniels promo of the Dark Order and I have to tell you, I was marking out. Number one, I love Christopher Daniels. I like him as the fallen angel. I almost hope there's a swerve and he's the leader of the Dark Order. But after seeing, you know, his uh, commercial, and yes, I'm doing finger quotes, but um, I was really impressed with it. The little video package he put together, really making fun of him, uh, him dressing like the Dark Order in, in, you know, the sports jacket, and then uh, occasionally dressing in, of course, his SCU Christopher Daniels outfit. I, uh, I really enjoyed that. I'm excited that the Exalted One finally will be revealed next week. Um, 
I know a lot of people are betting on Matt Hardy. I hope it's not. I hope I don't I don't want him to be a leader of a cult. I like broken Matt Hardy in the broken universe. I hope he can explore that and expand it. Uh, in AEW, and AEW allows him to be super creative. I don't want him to be a leader of a cult. Brody Lee, however, the old Luke Harp, I think if he changes his look, I think if he cuts his hair, um, shaves his beard, with those crazy eyes that he had in the Wyatt family, I think that he could play a very, very good cult leader. I think if he comes out acting like Luke Harper and still same hair, beard, uh, wild man look of Luke Harper, I'm not going to buy it because I don't see anyone following Luke Harper. Um, He's not a cult leader. He's a wild hill jack from the backwoods. I want him to change up his demeanor, his character, how he talks, how he looks, everything, and become a true cult leader, and then maybe the Dark Order is something I can get behind, something that I will like, I will enjoy, uh, because Stu Grayson and Evil, you know, uh, yeah, they're just not getting it for me. So then we jump to the next match, which is Jurassic Express versus MJF with Warlow and the Butcher, the Blade, and the Bunny. Now, I'm not going to go off on the Butcher, the Blade, and the Bunny. You guys have heard me do that in past episodes. Um, I still have to say how much I love MJF, and he's having a birthday on Sunday and, and you know, going to be 24. Um, he is definitely the future of wrestling, along with Jungle Boy, who's 22. These two are going to take us into the next stage of wrestling. Are there some other youngsters out there that's going to take us? Oh, yeah, Sammy Guevara is definitely going to be one of them. Darby Allen is going to be one of them. I mean, yes, but uh, MJF right now is probably the best deal in the business Um, at 24 years old. And so, I just love his do-anything heel persona. Um, I love the part in the match where, you know, he basically is trying to run away from Luchasaurus and uh, runs into Jungle Boy and Marco Stunt. So, he drops his knees and basically starts begging, and Butcher and Blade have to come over and save him. Um, I, I enjoy that part of his Hill character, where he thinks he's so charming and smart and better than everyone, but then when he comes up against the odds, he, he wants somebody to save him. I, I really enjoy that part of his character. On the other hand, um, I hate Marco Stunt's character. Now, I'm not saying I hate Marco Stunt. I'm saying I hate his character. I feel like... I don't know whether he's portraying it or whether they're telling him to portray it. I feel like he's a cartoon. I feel like he he is just... I don't know. Acting like a cartoon. Like, at one point he's bigger and badder and then he gets scrap knocked out of, his, out of him. And he wants to make a comeback, but he can't. Um... And I'm kind of tired of seeing that. I I don't know what his role should be. I don't know what his character needs to turn into. I don't have a solution for that. But I, I'm beginning to start to hate his character. I don't think he fits in with the Jurassic Express. And I, I, I don't know. I don't know what should be done with him. Um, but I enjoyed Luchasaurus, and I believe it was the uh, Butcher headbutting each other a couple times. It got me wondering, how does Luchasaurus' uh, horns feel when he headbutts you? 
Um, the only thing that I really don't like is him having to adjust his mask. I know that it gets knocked around when you're headbutting people, but when he reaches up to adjust that, then it, it does make me realize, oh, you know, he is wearing a mask, and, and it brings me back to reality, and I don't want to do that. Um, I hated it. That Marco uh, ended up tagging himself in there at the end so that he could on MJF and the referee telling him, you know, to stop. And Jungle Boy wanted to maybe do a move together or for Marco Stunt to allow him to take over. But, you know, Marco basically tells Jungle Boy to get out of the ring. Um, Jungle Boy actually climbs up on the ring post, and Marco is dragging MJF out to the center of the ring, and I can't tell whether Marco actually agreed that Jungle Boy needed to be doing a move, or whether Marco was going to try one of his moves. But anyway, you know, Bunny has to to jump up on the apron. Now, she attracts the attention of the ref, but really what she's doing is distracting Jungle Boy. She's blowing him kisses and waving and flirting, and the blade jumps up on the apron and pushes Jungle Boy off the ring post. Well, when this is done, it's almost like Marco Stunt didn't really know what to do, and MJF, being the quick uh, superstar that he is, basically rolls over and and gets Marco in the salt of the earth, which is, you know, an arm bar, and gets him to, of course, tap. And so it was kind of a, almost a letdown. Um, Just didn't... I just felt like this this match didn't flow. And I think a lot of it is the Butcher and the Blade and MJF aren't really a trio. I don't know that why they're really together. I know they're trying to put MJF against Jungle Boy, and they want Marco Stunt and Luchasaurus to be involved just because they're so popular. But I don't know that putting MJF with another tag team, especially the Butcher and the Blade, I don't know that that's necessarily the right thing. And I've been saying this for a couple episodes. AEW really needs to watch the Butcher and the Blade almost seem like a cult themselves. So putting them right off on the screen or putting them right after a Dark Order promo or a Dark Order match just doesn't fit to me it whoever goes on after um whether the dark orders first and then the butcher and the blade go next or vice versa whoever has to follow the other one i'm kind of bored i'm kind of tired of it i i want them to hurry up because i feel like i've seen it because i feel like right now the dark order and the butcher and the blade are similar And I know they're not. Uh, The Dark Order is a cult faction. So I'm really hoping there's going to be some differences made there. And of course, you know, with us being in Salt Lake City, we have to have an interview with Britt Baker and bring her out. Uh, Tony Schiavone, of course, who just loves Britt Baker to death, um gets the opportunity to interview her and of course she's got to be insulting to Utah and talks about how you know she wanted to drink a bunch of caffeine but you know the Mormons are against that how she would like to down a few with Tony but you know Utah is against alcohol and she basically calls them fat and tells them they have uh, bad teeth, and he, she talks about how all of them look alike, kind of insinuating they're inbred. 
I kind of enjoy this side of Britt Baker. This smart alecky, smarmy side of things. It's almost like she's pulling um, Adam Cole. Um, just kind of doing his kind of shtick. And it works for her. And they should have done this in the beginning and try to, instead of trying to, you know, make her a baby face. However, she's a chicken heel. And I don't know that she necessarily needs to be. Or maybe she does until she gets her wrestling down better. I don't know. But, um, thought it, it, it was interesting for her to give positive comments that Utah could be anything that they wanted to be, even dental assistance and everything. Now, loved it that Big Swole come out. And Britt Baker goes behind Tony, and she calls out Britt Baker for hiding behind Tony, and you can tell Big Swole is very comfortable in the mic, very comfortable with her comebacks. Um, she has got a lot more experience than Britt Baker, and I liked her confronting her. I loved it and if you didn't get to see it you need to YouTube this moment or you need to go on AEW and see if they've got a clip of it I absolutely love it when Britt Baker says well the only one who wants to see you out here and who likes you is your boyfriend well I mean Big Swole's come back is immediate and she flashes the rock on her finger and says I am married baby and of course she's married she's married to Cedric Alexander who is in the WWE with Britt Baker's boyfriend Adam Cole and so I loved how you know they played off of, of each other's men, uh, you know, Cedric Alexander and, and Adam Cole, and brought them and the insiders in on the inside joke that they were playing. And I loved it that Baker took the coffee that she brought out for Tony and threw it on Big Swole and then ran away. Because like I said, she's a chicken heel. And, um, I was actually shocked Big Swole didn't go after her. Uh, the referee was a little late in coming out and stopping her, and Tony wasn't going to stop her. Um, I wish they would have let, you know, Big Swole go after her, and then did a follow-up a little later about, you know, what was happening or what did happen. Now, we get Joey Janela... And Private Party versus the Death Triangle. Now, I'm going to be very honest with you. I saw them putting together this match and really thought this is going to be a runaway. Um, we don't really see Joey Janela much. I don't know a whole lot about him. I'm going to be very honest with you. I did not follow his independent wrestling career. Um, I know he is known for a lot of hot, hardcore or uh, blood matches. And his match with John Moxley was excellent. I loved it. It's one of my favorites I think AEW has done so far. But we just haven't seen enough of him. Um, I know that he's, again, fulfilling a lot of his indie contracts. We definitely haven't seen... I feel a lot of private party. And like I've said before, I almost feel like private party and street profits from WWE are interchangeable. Um, I feel like their shtick is a similar. I feel like a lot of their moves are similar. And so I just automatically, when I saw them come out together and they were going against the Death Triangle, I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be a quick jobber match. Um, I like that 
they have created this death triangle with Pac and um, the Lucha Brothers. But I need to tell you guys, I hope they still do things apart. I understand putting them together, but don't put everybody in a faction. I don't want. I don't. I don't want to see that. Um, I like this group together. I think they work well together. But I still want to see Pac be Pac and go after single stuff. And I still definitely want to see the Lucha Brothers be the Lucha Brothers. You know. And I almost think that Private Party versus the Lucha Brothers would have been a better match. And I mean, I, I'm not saying anything bad against Joe Janela or Pac. Uh, but, I mean, that would have been a great match too. This match was a high-flying match when Private Party and Pentagon and Phoenix were, were in the match. And, of course, Janela was doing his crazy stuff. Um, I was really surprised by Janela's quickness. And I'm always surprised with Pac's power that he has now. He didn't show that in the WWE as Neville. And I love that he has balked up some and that he has some power. Uh, the ending of this match was pretty cool as far as Ray Phoenix getting tagged in and hitting Janela with a cutter. And then he and Pentagon, of course, their combo moves are unbelievable. They're all the time thinking up something new. But this time they did their typical pile driver stomp. And then... Pentagon drug him over so that Pac could hit him with the block arrow and pin him. The block arrow to me is just unbelievable that he can do that many flips and that it can look so graceful in the air. So I'm always impressed when, when he hits that. Now, afterwards, they do what Tony Schiavone called the Death Triangle Submission. I am not even really going to be able to describe that to you guys. They lined all three guys up and um, basically did um, like Sasha Banks' uh, bank statement or uh, Daniel O'Brien's yes lock. But they interwove each other's arms through each other. It, it was a weirdly cool kind of submission move. Until the best friends run out. And then Orange Cassidy comes out, you know, to kind of make the save. Um, not real sure why... The Death Triangle didn't just beat down the best friends while Orange Cassidy was taking his good old time. But, um, they didn't. And, I guess that's okay. You know, especially with, uh, them announcing that the best friends and Orange Cassidy are going to take on Death Triangle next week. Um, we go to an interview and they make mention that they saw Dustin Rhodes walking around backstage earlier in the day. He wasn't dressed. He didn't have his makeup on. He wasn't planning on wrestling. And she says, you know, kind of what changed her mind. Well, you can tell. I mean, I don't even know why they even had her ask a question other just hand the mic to him. Uh, Dustin Rhodes just proceeds to literally go off. Uh, his face is painted. He's in ring gear. And he tells you, I am pissed off. I am tired of the inner circle. Uh, I am tired of them hurting my family. Um, he considers himself part of the elite through Cody. And he has become friends with the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega. And I really think his emotion made me feel that. 
it made me feel like he feels like he's part of the elite family. And he looks directly in the camera and says, you know, he's going to be Hangman Page's partner tonight whether he wants him or not. And I love that about Dustin Rhodes. And I... And I believe him. I believe that if Hangman says no, then Dustin's going to whoop up on him and go out and face the inner, inner circle by himself. Um, that's how mad he is. And like I said, I I absolutely just love that. Then we get next week's matches. They make sure to know that the Exalted One is going to be revealed. That they have now said that the best friends in Orange Cassidy are going to take on the Death Triangle. And then, which I didn't know, the Inner Circle is going to be versus the Elite in a tag match. Now, um, I, I don't know about that. We all know... It's five on five. And we all know that the five inner circle right now at this point are healthy, whereas the lead are not. So not sure what I think about this tag match and how it's going to go. But uh, JR does tell us that the winner gets an advantage in the Blood and Guts match on March 25th. And that uh, advantage is going to be after the contestants enter the cage, the first two. Then you get to send someone in every two minutes after and the advantage is, is they're going to be able to go in first. And so it's a pretty big advantage. I'm predicting now, I, I really think the inner circles are going to get that advantage. And they're going to use it to their full extent. And I actually am kind of excited about that. Um, another thing, if you didn't see it, you didn't DVR it, no one told you about it. Look it up on AEW.com. Look it up on YouTube. I'm sure somebody's got it up there. Look at uh, JR interviewing John Moxley earlier in the day. I think this should be shown to any young wrestler, anybody on the indies. You guys need to look at this. This promo that John Moxley does, number one, you can tell is off of. Um, it's interesting, it's exciting, he is threatening when he needs to be, he's calm, um, cool psychopath when he needs to be, he doesn't care to make threats, um, love that it's with JR. JR knows how to interview people, how to ask this question and just kind of let you go. And pick out a key word or two of, from what you've said to ask a question to allow you either to go further or to turn it into something else. And so I love this promo with John Moxley because JR starts off saying, you know, I understand that you're medically suspended after what the inner circle did to you by powerbombing you through the stage last week and that you can't even be at the arena tonight. And um, he then asks him to talk about his injuries. Moxley's comeback is, I'm not going to elaborate on my injuries. I'm pissed off. I'm tired of this. Um, But he makes a point to say, that it was him versus the inner circle, and he's winning, and he holds up the belt, and it's so true. Um, he's taken them on for I don't know the last four to six weeks, and he is winning. He's got the belt, um, but Jr. kind of 
has to bring him back down and say, you know, it's one against five odds. Um, champ, you don't have a chance. And Moxley gets this look in his eye almost like, well, JR, um, don't dare me. But he goes off on Hager, on J- Jake Hager, and he challenges him and says, you know, nice powerbomb there. Won't you step up to the batter's box? And I think maybe that's where this is going. Maybe we're going to see the inner circle, meaning Jericho, Sammy, Santana, Ortiz, kind of turn and take on Cody Omega and the Young Bucks. But they're going to kind of branch Jake Hager off to deal with John Moxley. And if so, after watching Moxley tonight, I'm, I'm pretty excited, even though I don't think Hager's that great of a wrestler, because he says Hager hit him harder than anyone he's ever faced. And he says, you can go look up the list. But to me, he's just another guy in AEW. And JR asked them about blood and guts, and he says, you know, I'm not going to miss that for the world. Um, he says the inner circle has their hands full with the elite boys, and I'm kind of in a blind spot. They don't see me, and that should scare them. What that tells me is I need to put March 25th on my calendar, because somehow, some way. John Moxley's getting involved. Now, whether that's before, during, or after the Blood and Guts match, he's going to get involved. And him around that cage, the Blood and Guts match is supposed to take place in two rings with one cage. If John Moxley gets anywhere near that cage, it's going to get interesting and it's going to get exciting. And then, of course, we jump to the main event. Um, I wasn't real excited about the main event. I'm just going to be honest with you. Um, Hangman Page and Dustin Rhodes don't really excite me. And I like Chris Jericho and Sammy Guevara together. I hate that Hager, Santana, and Ortiz has to come down every time. Yes, I know they're the inner circle. They're a faction. They come down like the Four Horsemen did. Totally get that. But it gets old after a while. Especially when you saw Brandy and QT Marshall walk Dustin out, but yet didn't come down. Um, Just really weird to me. So, um, this match starts off, and it's, I don't know, a little slow. Um, there's a lot of skits, almost, I don't know another word to really describe it. You know, kind of like Sammy, or, excuse me, Jericho teasing Heyman Page in the beginning, and and acting like he's going to do a lockup, and then kind of running back to the corner and slapping Sammy and putting Sammy to start the match with Hangman Page. There was a lot of, of, of that going on. I can say that one of my favorite moments, though, was Chris Jericho grabbing a beer and basically sipping it like he does his uh, little bit of the bubbly. Uh, and then him shouting, I am a cowboy, I'm a cowboy. And Paige punches him and takes his beer and drinks it. Now, of course, Sammy has to come over and hit him with a running kick. But uh, I did enjoy that interaction. Um, I felt like in this match, though, it opened my eyes. I had been hearing people that had saw Hangman Page in, in other promotions 
talk about his athleticism and how quick he was for a big man and some of the spots that he pulled. I saw him a couple times in Ring of Honor, but his character didn't grab me. And so I'll, I'll just be real honest. In Ring of Honor, a lot of times I fast forwarded through his matches or I would watch bits and pieces and then fast forward to them. But I really sit down and watch this match um, basically because Jericho and Sammy. But I could see what everybody's been talking about as far as his athleticism. I feel like he's young and he's a little bit unexperienced and I know that being in your 20s you you do have a lot to learn but if healthy he is also going to be one of the young superstars to take us into the next generation you know um I like that Jericho pulled out all of his famous hits in this match, he gets Paige in the walls of Jericho. And of course, as soon as he turned him, I was marking out. I was like, I love the walls of Jericho. Um, of course, Dustin runs in to save him before, you know, Hangman taps out or anything. Um, Sammy tags in and tries to do a shooting star press on Hangman Page and misses because Page, you know, of course, gets out of the way. And Page hits him with the buckshot lariat for the win. After, and this is not another highlight clip that you need to look up on AEW.com or you need to look up on YouTube. After, Dustin Rhodes, who broke up the walls of Jericho. He did a Canadian destroyer on Sammy Guevara, and it was awesome. Um, the power and the quickness that Dustin does that move with was unreal. And then, of course, with Hangman Page following it up with the Buckshot Lariat, uh, you could see that if that was real life, Sammy would be going down for the pin because those two moves have something about them where they grab your attention and you feel it. You feel the pain, you know. But almost as soon as the referee's arm goes down on the count of three, we see Hager, San Santana, and Ortiz jump in and basically just start beating down Hangman and Dustin. And Kenny Omega comes out to help. Now, before I continue describing the action, I said earlier... I was kind of getting tired of the inner circle bringing all five. And I mentioned how Dustin was walked out by QT Marshall and Brandy Rhodes. Well, now we see Kenny Omega. Now I know he's got a broken hand. But why did he not come down with Hangman Page? Why did he not walk out with him? Why did he, even though, you know, he doesn't, he can't be dressed. He can't. He's not medically cleared or whatever they're saying. The thing is, why didn't he at least come and be there ringside? Uh, him running in to me was a little stupid. But he comes down to help and they hold him and Jericho hits him with the Judas effect. And then he hits Hangman Page with the code breaker. And like I said, whoop, we are pulling out all of Jericho's greatest hits from the walls of Jericho to the Judas Effect to the code breaker. And after that, Cody comes down. He's back from the hospital. And he comes down and he starts throwing his weight around and kicking people until... Uh, Jake Hager gets the best out of him and basically just beats him down, 
throws him out of the ring. When he does, he throws him to Ortiz, who pays him back for the match that they had earlier by busting Cody on the ramp. And they drag Hang- Hangman Page up the ramp and are getting ready to do the Shields powerbomb with Santana Ortiz and Jake Hager through the stage just like they did to Moxley last week when Matt Jackson runs out. Which leaves me to believe, again, I have to put some logic in here, why didn't Matt Jackson come down when Cody did? They rode in the same car. Obviously, they got back from the hospital at the same time. If Cody recognized that his brother needed help, that Kenny Omega needed help, why didn't Matt Jackson? What was he, was he used in the bathroom? What was going on? But anyway, uh, Matt Jackson runs out to save Hangman, and he starts super kicking Jake Hager, and then he double spears. Uh, Santana and Ortiz. Of course, Hangman Page is just getting up. He's on his knees, and he is not a bit grateful to Matt Jackson for saving him from getting powerbombed through the stage. So, uh, Matt Jackson takes one look at his face and flips him off, and goes to turn around, and I'm sure to go check on his buddies, and Jericho hits Matt with a chair, and then takes the chair and hauls off and hits Hangman Page. So we have the camera shooting the anger angles and JR painting the picture of Kenny Omega broken hand laying in the ring. Cody on the ramp, out of it, you know, just laying there, grabbing his knee, his head's hurting. And then two on the stage of Matt and Hangman out of it. And so Jericho puts the chair down on top of Matt, sets on it, and the inner circle pose, just like they did last week, uh, flipping everybody off in TV land. Um, Another good show. Not a great show. But a really good show. Um, I can't wait for this coming week's Dynamite. I really can't. Uh, Am I excited about the matches? Uh, Yeah, I'm a little excited about the Inner Circle versus the Elite Tag Team match. I, I could care less about Best Friends taking on the Death Triangle because it's going to be a joke and they're going to job out to him. Uh, The Exalted one, I'm a little excited about that just for the simple fact I want that storyline to move uh, in some way somehow and I'm hoping that by getting a leader and them turning into a cult that it will do that. If not, then I want them to drop it and move on. Uh, but I'll tell you, what I'm really interested in is AEW has had, or will have had, two times that they can watch WWE putting on matches to no crowd. And they have been able to brainstorm for about a week now on how they're going to do that. Because next week's Dynamite is going to be close set, no audience. And somehow, some way, I think they work, make it work way better than WWE. I think we don't see any repeat matches like WWE has been showing. I think we see vignettes kind of like being the late is taped. I think we do see some matches, and we see some good matches. I think they're going to bring it. I really, really do, and I can't wait. So, guys, if you have any questions, comments, problems, or protests about this Raves and Rants review, feel free to contact me at wrestlingovertime.com 
at gmail.com. Let me know what you think. Hit me up on uh, Wrestling Overtime uh, Twitter page or Facebook page. On our Facebook page, we are putting up links to any independent wrestler that is showing their matches, whether it be on their own website, whether it be on Independent Wrestling TV's website, whether it be on YouTube, whatever. If I can find where you guys that are um, hold up because of the coronavirus um, pandemic that is going on, I'm going to try to get as many matches as I can to you guys, especially for free. So, don't forget to check Wrestling Overtime's Facebook page. Not only am I putting news and updates up there, I am putting links to free shows. Uh, please, during this time, do not forget our indie wrestlers who are struggling. Um, buy their merch. They're not being able to wrestle matches. A lot of them do not have second jobs. The only way they right now can get money is by you buying their merch. Go to their website. You go to your favorite any wrestler's website if they have one and buy their merch. Or hit up Pro Wrestling Tees and buy their merch. Cody and Jericho are putting out their own t-shirts and they are not AEW shirts. They are their own t-shirts and all proceeds are going to the coronavirus pandemic and it's going to help people that are suffering through this. So go out and support your wrestlers please 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 um i can't tell you guys enough i am going to be offering more podcasts hopefully going to be uh reviewing some original content that is either going to be on youtube or on the wwe network um i may do uh some of Stone Cold Steve Austin's Broken Skull Sessions. For those of you who don't have the network, review those and, and talk a little bit about those. Or Table of Three or something like that. Um, so be looking for extra content uh, this coming week. Or, you know, for however long that I can give it to you that you can listen to at work. Make sure you pay attention to the topics and read what the the podcast episode is is about and see if it's something you're interested in and if it is um please listen to it leave me a content um uh, a review on podchaser.com uh that's where i'm collecting all of my reviews feel free please subscribe to the podcast so you can get a get any update podcast that I will be putting out and I hope to talk to all of you real soon